Lane University and his PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. An expert in community engagement and digital writing studies, he has garnered national recognition for his work in these fields. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. McCarthy. Thank you, Dean Gary. Graduating class of 2019. It is an honor to have the opportunity to speak to you today. Let me begin with what I'm sure you've heard again and again and again and again, that you have the world ahead of you. Everybody sitting with you today is so happy for you. And we're also a little bit jealous because beginnings are always exciting. But if we're honest, we also understand that along with the great achievement and relief of finishing your time here at JMU, you're probably more than a little nervous, right? Many of you are going to your first job. Some of you are going on to grad school. Some of you are, going, are waiting on decisions or weighing up your options while you take over your parents' basement. Mm -hmm. I know that's what I did. In fact, I did it more than once in my 20s, and there's no shame in it at all. <laughs> so you've got joy, apprehension, excitement, maybe even a little terror. In other words, you're experiencing all the feels. Am I right? Yep, I'm seeing a lot of bobbing mortarboards out there. And at such a public event, wearing such brightly purple clothes, there's no pressure at all, right? What I want to do for the next few minutes is to tap into that vulnerability that you're feeling right now. I've had a few more careers than I can count, and I've moved around a lot, so you could say that I'm kind of an expert in it. I'm a rhetorician by training, but I'm also interested in how, so I'm interested in how we communicate and what we communicate. And I'm especially invested in the idea of vulnerability because it, it isn't something that we like to reveal normally to others. After all, the traditional definition is to leave ourselves open to attack, either physically or emotionally. But what I want to chat about today is how vulnerability can and must be at the very essence of how we live, love, work and play. And on this day of all days, I want to explore vulner how vulnerability connects you to your authentic self, to your future, to this country and indeed to the entire planet. As you can see, I like tidy thesis statements. You can likely tell from my accent that I'm not from Harrisonburg. I'm from Roanoke, actually. Well, no, that's not, I just. I'm from the west of Ireland, as Dean Aguirre said. I earned my BA from what was then the Univers uh, University College Galway way back in 1993. Like your parents that sit behind you, mine were beaming with pride on graduation day. They had not been to college and I was the eldest child, so it was a big deal for all of us. Upon graduation, I traveled a lot, trying out jobs of various shapes and sizes before moving to the US to do my graduate work. Traveling after college felt natural to me because immigration is such a huge part of Irish identity. As a kid, I remember everyone returning home for the Christmas holidays from Chicago, Boston, New York, London, Birmingham and Brisbane. For a, shoot, for a few short weeks, the village was flooded with cash and mirth, soon to be followed by that familiar hollow emptiness when everyone had to leave for another year. For those of us who grew up during decades when immigration was rampant, Ireland and America were inseparable. We feel a deep sense of connectedness to this country and the opportunities it has afforded us. But that gratitude is intertwined with a quiet sadness when you're so far away from those who we love. I get that double feeling every time I talk to my mom on Skype. She lives in a small village where I grew up, which is called Lascanor. And here's a fun fact that some of you might have heard before. Have we all seen The Princess Bride? Of course you've all seen The Princess Bride. Um, uh, do you remember the scene where they climbed the Cliffs of Insanity? <laughs> well, the Cliffs of Insanity is actually a place called the Cliffs of Moher, which is where I'm from. So every year I begin my classes with, um, hello, my name is Sean, I'm your instructor, and I am from the Cliffs of Insanity. <laughs> Sometimes my students remind me this of my yearly evaluations. Uh, thank you for putting up with me. 
You know, Ireland is a very small place, smaller than the state of Virginia, and with fewer people than uh, DC and Nova combined. It seems to have an outsized personality for a place that small, though. One could argue that it's the Guinness or the music. I hope it's not just Riverdance. Um, but I have a pet theory that we're a particularly loud culture because we've had a long time learning how to be vulnerable. We've been emigrating for centuries, often under the direst of circumstances. So when we gathered abroad, the Irish, along with many other migrant populations, we leaned into each other, forming support networks and vibrant cultures. You see, the thing about vulnerability is that, yes, it can expose you to harm, but it's also the condition that exposes you to human connection, to love and to community. You can't love someone without being vulnerable. You can't lead people without being vulnerable. You can't create or innovate with tapping into the side of you that admits loudly and proudly, um, yeah, I don't really know what I'm doing right now. And this is what interests me about vulnerability as a rhetorician. The strength that comes from exposing what you don't know rather than at bulletproof arguments about what you do. Professor Brene Brown of the University of Houston has done extensive research on vulnerability, and she argues that to be vulnerable to each other is the most important step in building meaningful relationships. During a now famous TED talk she delivered a few years back, she suggested that vulnerability is not winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up and be seen when we have no control over the outcome. Vulnerability is not weakness. It is our greatest measure of strength. So, my wish for you today is that you use my brief remarks as a chance to reorient yourselves towards vulnerability, to actually regard it as strength. Tapping into it is going to help your life, your loves, and your career. It's also going to be the single most important way you navigate your role as a citizen. I want to be clear that what I'm about to talk about next is done as someone who is in the process of gaining citizenship here in this country and is done from the perspective of my expertise as a rhetorician and not from a party political perspective. The truth is that you are inheriting a world that is currently in turmoil with precarious economies and an ever widening gap between rich and poor. Far right wing populist regimes and movements are capitalizing on this instability to shore up wealth and in the process are inflicting serious damage on democratic institutions and individual rights. And this pernicious ideology is spreading like wildfire because it is exploiting our most important asset, our vulnerability. It recognizes that we are our greatest strength so instead, it tricks us into being afraid of each other, afraid of losing what we have, afraid of change. The more we fear and distrust each other, the more we divide ourselves into groups that say, I'm right, and you're wrong, and I have rights, and you have none. Of course, the, fund way, the fundamental way to accomplish this is to destroy the empathetic, vulnerable connection between us. So right-wing populist movements tend to divert us towards something else, often an idealized past. As you know, Brexit, to use the technical, technical term, is a hot mess right now. In fact, it has the potential to redivide my own country in Ireland in damaging and even violent ways. The practical, of Brex the practical benefits of Brexit are notoriously vague, but the guiding narrative is crystal clear to return to a glorious state of isolation. And the narrative here, to make America great again. The problems with narratives such as these is that they force us to look away from each other and into some sort of abstract space. It makes debate impossible because we don't know what we're debating about. As a result, we end up shouting across each other and being diverted by alternative facts. So here's how we change that script. We take the backward looking glance of making America great again, and we gently nudge it into the present by making America great again and again and again and again and again. Every time we lean into situations we do not control, every time we treat not knowing with an open heart and an open mind, every time we say, no matter where you are from, we are glad you are our neighbor. It is in these small moments that greatness lies. These moments will give us the strength to forge a new politics. 
to learn to treat ourselves and the environment with care and with respect, and to build a vibrant culture that is inclusive and daring and innovative. As I said earlier, this is not a partisan argument. This is a human plea. Disagreement is the engine of politics and, frankly, of progress. But only if we are able to see each other, hear each other, and to acknowledge the discomfort that not knowing the answer brings. It's within everybody's grasp, and it's the source of our greatest joy and our deepest responsibility. I'm telling you this, graduating class of 2019, because the generations that precede you have often been entrenched in worldviews and problem-solving strategies that are in this present moment exhausted and broken. You may not feel it right now, but if you move forward from this day, gathering together your education, an open heart, and a beginner's mindset, you will change the world. I want us to close out with a small ceremony. To be vulnerable, you have to be present. It sounds self-evident, but most of the time our heads are elsewhere, and we're so bombarded by our little pinging devices that we can barely hear ourselves think. But there's a solution to finding presence, and it's in everyone's grasp. Simply breathe. By breathing, you anchor your presence, and by being present, you are in a position to be vulnerable, and by being vulnerable, you find your strength. I've started to incorporate breathing exercise into my classes to great success because we all crave to simply present to ourselves without distraction and to remove ourselves from our busy lives. So graduating class of 2019, I want us to breathe together. If you're not already doing so, please sit in your seats with a straight back. Imagine there's a little string attached to the tassel of your mortarboard and is gently pulling you into a nice and relaxed but upright position. Place your hands in your lap, though, since if you're around folks that you love, then feel free to hold hands. It is a special day after all. And everybody here on the quad is welcome to join in. Now, I want you to take a nice, big, deep breath. And breathing again, I would like you to do so and close your eyes if you feel comfortable. Now, for the next few breaths, I just want you to focus on the rise and fall of your chest as you inhale and exhale. Now focus on the sounds around you, the presence of others on the quad, the traffic. And now in your mind's eye, imagine you are floating above yourself looking down on this scene. Move slowly to the front of the stage where we sit, your teachers. The garments we wear today link us to a tradition of learning and teaching that have been passed down to us over centuries. Our training teaches us that good thinking and knowledge making takes time and care, and we have dedicated our lives to passing on those skills and values to you. As we prepare you to enter a world that grows ever more complex, we too must adapt our strategies and pool our disciplinary knowledge and methods. Thank you for teaching us day after day and year after year to learn and be vulnerable alongside you. Now, move across the lawn in your mind's eye and settle on your family sitting behind you. No one will ever love you like your family. It's an unconditional bond so strong that it can be a love that's difficult to, to control at times. Sometimes we get trapped in the roles of parent and child. Now, as you transition to another stage of your life that sees you truly claiming adulthood, celebrate that deep and unshakable family bond by getting to know each other differently, not as child and parent, but as adults and friends. There's vulnerability in that too. Now bring your attention back to where you're sitting. To conclude our little ceremony, we're going to listen to a poem by Gwendolyn Brooks. Brooks was Poet Laureate of Illinois, and in 1976, she became the first African-American woman inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters. We have a special relationship with Brooks here in the College of Arts and Letters. In 1994, she visited James Madison University as the central figure of the Furious Flower Poetry Conference, the name of which was taken from a poem of hers. Just last week, students from this college and elsewhere on campus proudly unveiled a magnificent digital archive of that conference, which honors black poetry and the memory of Gwendolyn Brooks. The poem I'm going to read to you today is called Paul Robeson, in memory of the great singer and political activist. 
That time, we all heard it. That time, cool and clear, cutting across the hot grit of the day, the major voice, the adult voice, forgoing rolling river, forgoing tearful tale of bale and barge and other symptoms of an old despond. Warning in music words, devout and large, that we are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. Now you may open your eyes. Graduating class of 2019, it was a deep honor to talk to you today. Thank you from the bottom of my heart.